Uh, Alright, hello everyone and uh, thank you for being here. Um, what I thought I might do is share some thoughts on two aspects of the Occupy movement that interest me the most, or at least two of many aspects that interest me the most. And I would like to sort of inform my discussion of these aspects by referring to two European political philosophers, uh, Slova Zizak and also the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben. So I'll tell you a bit about these philosophers and their ideas, and then also give you a bit of an interpretation of some of what's going on with the Occupy movement. So first, uh, well, to tell you what aspects I'm interested in, the two I would like to talk about uh, is first the sort of strange inability of mainstream media and politicians to either hear or understand the message of the Occupy movement. And the second aspect is actually the strategy of occupation itself. I think this is a very interesting strategy and there's a lot uh, of interesting elements we can talk about. So I'll start by talking about Zizak. Uh, Zizak discusses uh, the predominance in contemporary society of what he calls the forced choice. Uh, the forced choice is a choice in which you're given several options, but none of those options that you're given allow you to significantly change the situation in which the choice is demanded of you. Uh, and none of the options allow you to opt out of the situation either. So the easiest model for a forced choice is when the mugger walks up with a gun and says, your money or your life. In that context, you're given a choice, you have two different options, but neither of those options allow you to leave the situation, and any choice you make serves to reinforce the lack of freedom that the situation you find yourself in uh, has placed you in. So for Zizak, uh, he suggests that a lot of our contemporary political choices have this characteristic of forced choice. Not in the sense that there's a gun to our heads, but in the sense that none of the options that are being offered actually allow for systematic change, for a change on a level that would actually address systematic injustice. Uh, so, um, to take an example, if you think about the two-party system in America, there's important and interesting differences between the parties, without a doubt, but neither party, uh, supporting neither party, will serve to actually change the political dominance, the monopoly that both parties exercise over the American political dialogue. And further, if your concern is something like the role that corporation sponsorship and money interests play in American politics, supporting either party will fail to actually change the structure of corporate power. So, here we have a forced choice. Now, what Zizak suggests is that the way in which a forced choice in politics is uh, enforced is through a sort of a double strategy. The double strategy is that options that don't fit the forced choice are either presented as unrealistic, unachievable, or they're presented as incoherent. So either you refuse to hear them as meaningful suggestions at all, or you hear them as idealistic and unrealistic. Um, so what's interesting about the forced choice is that it serves an important structure, it serves an important uh, uh, service for the systems that are in place. It takes energy that could be directed towards opposing the system and redirects it into smaller changes that fit within the system. And by doing so, channels energy away from larger demands. And this actually serves to increase the efficiency of the system, but never actually challenge its foundation. Yes? Do you think that that would be better? Yeah. Absolutely. So if you think about uh, our current political environment, yeah, that is better. Uh, if you think about our current political environment and, for example, debates on the economy, what you see is that there's uh, two main, very general options that are considered uh, allowed within the forced choice that's presented. The two options are uh, limiting government power and therefore also usually limiting government spending and government taxation, or increasing government power, government taxation, and government spending. 
These are understood as the two sort of acceptable political proposals. Anything without, uh, outside of that structure is silenced as not uh, workable, not practical, or not meaningful. But if you think about it, the proposals of the Tea Party, for example, to do away with most government taxation and most uh, government-sponsored social services are no harder to implement and no more dramatic than the proposals you hear from the Occupy movement. So for example, the idea of getting money out of politics, a uh, uh, constitutional amendment, for example, to uh, limit or put an end to lobbying and the uh, corporate sponsorship of politics. This is no more practically difficult than actually ending taxation to a large extent and ending social services. So although you hear that there's some difference between these proposals in terms of practicality, it certainly doesn't seem like that's what's going on. That's not actually the concern. On the other hand, if you think about the claims that we don't have a coherent message, these seem simply bizarre. The uh, you know, basic position of the Occupy movement, that government should be equally concerned with all of its citizens rather than primarily serving the interests of corporations and the richest 1%, is pithy, it's direct, it's to the point. There's no problem of coherence there. It's a powerful message. So when we hear things like there's no coherent message, or the proposals aren't practical, what you're hearing is actually that they don't fit into the system of the proposed forced choices that uh, is reinforced again through these strategies that I've mentioned. Now, it's worth asking why. Why don't they fit within that system? What is it that puts them outside of the forced choice? Well, if you think about it, what the Occupy movement proposes is something that would count as a non-incidental uh, change, right? It's a systematic change. Why is it non-incidental? Well, sure, doing away with income tax or, you know, doing away with welfare, these are very dramatic proposals from the, the side of the Tea Party. Uh, but they're still incidental in the sense that smaller government or larger government, you don't actually affect the power of corporations over either your lives or over political power. So if the system is actually one of corporate and rich control, that system is unaltered by making the government larger, making it smaller, increasing taxation, lowering taxation. At least unaltered in a dramatic way. So these proposals fit within the remaining power of the structure we have. When you propose, however, getting money out of politics, you're proposing a fundamental change to the American political system. Because although we can appropriately describe the American political system in terms of democracy, in terms of representative democracy, in terms of republicanism, etc., in practice, it's plutocracy. In practice, at least uh, through indirect means, it's control of the very rich interests. So when you propose something like getting money out of politics, you're proposing a radical change of the system rather than an incidental tweaking from within that system. All right, so that's what I wanted to say um, about the inability to hear our message and about Shisha. I'd like to talk now about Agamben. So the Italian uh, philosopher Agamben, Giorgio Agamben, uh, talks about what he calls the state of exception. And he says that all modern political and governmental power has the tendency to turn into the power to declare a state of exception. A state of exception is one in which you uh, declare normal law and normal rights as no longer in effect. So it's the suspending of law and the suspending of rights. Um, in, in, in effect, this is the power of the law to transcend its own limitations, to transcend itself. And Agamben thinks that most modern political power tends in this direction if it's allowed to. Um, now, there are dramatic examples of this, of course. So the declaring of martial law is a dramatic example of the power to declare a state of exception. Also, imminent domain uh, can be understood as a state of exception. But if Agamben's right and all governmental power tends in this direction in the current context, then you'd expect to find a lot of clear, everyday examples. And in fact, we do. So any example where something that seems like a fairly non-problematic, simple right can be suspended for uh, usually through an implicit declaration of a state of exception uh, will fit the bill for this power of the state of exception. So if you're looking for an everyday example, imagine something like my uh, freedom to cook you dinner. 
what could be more simple, sort of a more basic idea than that if I want to cook you dinner and share my food with you? This is a, a lab, right? And if I want to do it, you know, sitting at a park bench out there in the park, this also seems to be a pretty common freedom. It would be unusual if you suggested to people that they weren't allowed to do such a thing. However, have one of the people involved in who you're sharing your dinner or your lunch with be homeless. And suddenly within Jacksonville, it becomes illegal. A fairly simple, fairly free action that you wouldn't think is problematic seemingly magically becomes an illegal activity. Once one member of the transaction it lacks a certain social status, lacks a certain uh, monetary status. You see the same thing with almost all laws that address homelessness. They have this characteristic of a very unusual state of exception where someone's social class or uh, characteristics you wouldn't think would matter, how clean they are, how they look, etc., all of a sudden justifies the declaring of a state of exception. So if you think about anti-loitering laws, uh, these similarly are everyday laws that can arguably fit the state of exception. It seems like there's nothing more obvious than, you know, public space, I should be able to occupy a park, I mean occupy a bench in the park, in the public space. However, when I suddenly fit the category of not having a home, not having enough money, occupying it for too long, my freedom to occupy public space is uh, no longer in effect. I become accepted from that space. If I think about my hometown in New Jersey, they have an anti-loitering law where if you do not have a legal ID or a certain amount of money in your pocket, you, the simple activity of strolling through the town transforms into the illegal activity of loitering. Right? There's this very strange transformation where what I have in my pocket changes the uh, state of my action. Now you would think that having a legal ID or having a certain amount of money in my pocket has no effect upon my status as, as a citizen, the basic rights to public space that I should have as a citizen. But, surprisingly, it does have very much an effect upon my status as a citizen. So if you think about the Occupy movement's uh, actual strategy of occupation, uh, what you see here is that uh, there's a play on this characteristic. Uh, you would think that anyone would be able to stroll down Wall Street, and that the numbers of people wanting to walk down Wall Street, and the reason they want to do so, would not be legitimate reasons for taking away their right to uh, public space, the right to use public space. However, gather together, try to march down Wall Street when you're connected to this movement, and suddenly you're met with police barricades and police brutality. So you have an interesting state of exception. Now, what else is interesting is that the state of exception tends to come into uh, appearance. This is sort of an irony of it. It comes into appearance precisely at the moment when you declare that you want your rights, when you appeal to the law. So go about your everyday practices, be a good consumer, etc. And you would think that all space is free speech space, all public space is open to free speech. However, make an issue of that freedom. Demand your right to free speech, and you take yourself out of the protective, cate protective category of homeowner, consumer, business owner, etc. And suddenly you enter the category of bare citizen. And once you're in the category of bare citizen, you're always a little bit in danger because your citizenship, at least the rights that are uh, connected to it, can be revoked through these states of exceptions. So although we tend to think that the most protected situation we can put ourselves in is by declaring ourselves as citizens with rights, it's actually as a consumer that you're a lot more protected from something like government interference in your practices. And you see this with, uh, for example, the creation of free speech zones when you have public protests. You know, go through your everyday life and you think you can use your right to free speech wherever you like. Suddenly say, I am going to use my right to free speech, and they limit your right to free speech to a specific area that's usually fenced in, out of the way. All of a sudden you enter that very unique state of exception. Your free speech now only works within that space. So it's precisely by declaring your rights and demanding them that you open yourself up to being placed within the state of exception. Um, so, what's interesting and unique about the occupation strategy 
is that it forces the government, or at least some governmental powers, to reveal themselves in terms of declaring the state of exception. Because, of course, if most government power tends towards the decision on the state of exception, it's also uh, sort of necessary that it not appear to be doing so. The justification of the government power that we face is that it serves the citizens, it proposes laws, protects laws, etc. When it reveals itself as being that force which can decide law no longer applies, the rights no longer apply, it reveals itself to no longer be in service of the very reason it exists. It has transcended, gone beyond its reason for existence. So when you attempt to occupy a public space and you force the state of exception to become apparent, you are revealing the government to no longer at that point be serving uh, the goal for which it was created. So the strategy is actually very effective in this sense. Um, there's something else I want to say about this. If government power itself tends in this direction, it doesn't have to be uh, power based on the state of exception, but it tends in this direction. If it tends in this direction, you'd expect to find it in the day-to-day -day workings of government, in the ground level of government behavior. Which means, of course, that we tend to see the power to declare the state of exception not at the dramatic federal level, not in terms of you know, the, the federal power. Instead, it shows up in terms of the petty bureaucracies of county and city laws. It's at the ground level that the state of exception shows up. And this leads to some really sort of shocking considerations. So, uh, the paramilitary force that's been used throughout the country to suppress the Occupy movement and to sort of oppose the Occupy movement in its actions isn't justified at the federal level, isn't coming from the federal level. It's coming from state and county politicians. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that it sets up a bit of an illusion, right? Your rights can be declared by the Constitution, they can be symbolically defended by the federal government, but go about your daily business and what you see is that they're consistently called into question at the most local level from city employees, from city representatives, from county representatives. It's at that petty bureaucratic level that they're called into question. Consider what happened just fairly recently in New York. Who would have ever imagined that such an extensive, almost military maneuver in order to clear the park in New York would ever have been justified in terms of the need to hose out a city park. This is where you see the bureaucratic element of it. The laws that are supposedly being broken, the threats that are supposedly being posed, are threats of the most uh, sort of uninteresting procedural day-to-day -day bureaucratic concerns. So sure, we have tear gas, we close off entire blocks of New York City, we close airspace, we move out journalists, we make it, uh, for a time at least, not legally possible to report on the site in order to clear it and to close out the park. So things like closing out the park, keeping the sidewalk clear, are the justifications for these suspensions of basic rights. There's something incredibly Kafkaesque about this. Having clear sidewalks is more important than the very thing that most of us think government was formed in the first place to protect, our rights of speech, our rights to public space. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. That's actually the end of what I was planning on discussing. If you have questions or comments, I'm not sure how much time we have before the next teacher, but questions and comments are... I think that was a good presentation, but... I got a big problem that you think that there's a strategy of the Occupy movement. I've been down in Washington for a month and a half, and that certainly is not what they're doing. All right? Where are you getting that there is a strategy? There, this is a level organization. The only author of, uh, authorization is what is agreed by the General Assembly. Oh, absolutely. All right? No general, not every general assembly has approached this. Down in Washington, we believe the problem is with corporations, not with government. We spend our time down the Chamber of Commerce, not the House Chamber. Yes, yes. All right, you're talking about laws, it's just not the way other places are going. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, there's some that I, something that I would like to say about that. So uh, certainly when I say that it's a strategy, I don't propose that it's a strategy of the movement entirely, right? This is something that occurs in some places, not in other places, and I don't think that it was developed collectively or anything like that. I absolutely agree with that. That's a problem. Yes. People want a super GA, and I personally really yeah, actually, I think that I would tend to be opposed to that as well. So, I mean, I think you're right. This isn't a strategy of the Occupy movement in general, right? It's a strategy that's been used by some GAs to achieve some ends. Um, whether it's working or not, uh, I think it works in some ways and not in other ways, right? There's problems with it without a doubt. I think it's interesting that once the park in New York was cleared out, uh, in a sense, you got more support. So I think that for a while, the occupation of the, the park could have been having negative effects rather than positive effects. I think that this is absolutely true. But again, um, that, was done, that was done because of the corporation that owned the park. Yes, yes. Um, so I agree with you, too, yeah, that this is... should be out of that corporation. Yes, so... Not so much the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the point that the concern is with... Well, I'm sorry. Well, Shut it down. The law does their bidding. The law, who are paid by us, the taxpayer, yeah. do the corporation's bidding. Yeah, we should shut down that corporation. We should shut them all down. <laughs> well, who's going to shut it down? All right. Then who actually shuts it down? something, they even make a law to do something, and it doesn't happen. Well, that is, doesn't that point to the fact that then there is uh, some issue we have with government as well as with corporations? No, I think they're a waste of our time. Okay. But if you, if you, okay, I understand it's a, a, a real estate company that owns that. Yeah, not corporate. All right. It holds real that's all. Yeah, all right. Go down every time they want to sell something. Go down and uh, protest. Go talk to their holders, you know, yes, yes. the people that own that company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right? I, mean, I, I don't think uh, you're wrong, right? Uh, certainly. Uh, what I'm saying is there is no strategy. There are many, many strategies. Oh, yes. No, I agree. And that's why when I talk about the strategy of occupation, I meant one occurrence, one event, one strategy amongst many. I agree with you. There isn't a collective position. I agree with you, absolutely. Uh, is there a strategy, something that will enable you to achieve something? What I heard is that it's a rationale, not a strategy. So, uh, rationale for the Occupy movement. I don't hear a strategy on how to fix it. Well, uh, that may be true, but that wasn't uh, necessarily my concern, right? So I'm not attempting to, uh, in this context, propose uh, solutions. Um, I think that I was attempting to talk about some aspects of the movement that I think are philosophically interesting. I don't know what we can do to change it. We can't let uh, uh, people do our government because system is corrupt, and money uh, owns everything else, so what do you do? Well, I mean, there's been many sort of proposals, right? I don't want to come out necessarily in support uh, or opposition to, to any of them, but I think that the push for a you know, constitutional amendment with attempts to you know, overturn Citizens United, with attempts to sort of get money out of politics, I think that these are meaningful pushes. Uh, and I think that these are things that it's well worth considering and all we're talking about. Take, take your money out of the Bank of America if you have any money. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And don't buy from Walmart if you can. Oh, I agree. I mean, I think that the, the day of action where people were switching their money from large banks to credit unions was absolutely uh, the right type of action. I think that that's a good thing. Yes. Oh, yes. yeah. But what we're here for is to 
discuss and come up with the proposals, all right? And we, such as everybody says, the civil, let's study the civil rights movement. All right, did that solve it? I mean, we have to look for new creative ideas. But do we have them yet? No, but we cannot talk in uh, our politics. They don't debate. You can't talk in the media. They're all by five different companies. Unfortunately, our churches have been all purchased. I mean, that goes back to the Templars. Uh, and even our colleges now are being purchased. Uh, uh, the Koch brothers own uh, uh, Florida State University. Where else do we have to talk except for the parks? Mike check. Mike check. We have